Hey there, my name is Meng and welcome to part 3 of my Swift UI course. First of all, I just want to say it's really awesome that you got this far. We've had people who launched their own apps. Many of them had their first shot at iOS development and Swift UI is just the perfect way to get started. But of course, there's always more stuff to learn, such as the new morphic buttons here where we're using shadows, inner shadows, background overlays to create this awesome pressed effect. Here we're using a long press gesture to make sure that we have a minimum time before applying our button effects. So you can see only when I press for a long time that is going to switch. And we can even use that timing to create a progress effect such as the ring that we have learned earlier and a little bit of a masking here on the fingerprint icon. As you press lightly, the button expands, which is kind of mimicking what you see on the lock screen of iOS 13. And this is useful for interactions that shouldn't be accidental, such as the ones in the lock screen, but also the ones in the control panel of iOS. On top of that, it makes your buttons look really tactile and you can add haptic feedback to make your UI feel more dynamic. So we're gonna learn a lot of those new techniques and then come back to our main UI and then we can finally finish the login screen. This is the part where we couldn't squeeze in part two and I'm gonna make sure that we cover everything in part three. So again, we're gonna learn the parallax 3D effects here and the keyboard interaction, as well as connecting to Firebase. So I have a bad login. Let me put the correct login. So login and voila, we play a Lottie animation and now you're logged in. So this change your state and you're able to swipe down. Now this data is persistent, which means that if I go to Xcode and I run it again, it's going to remember that I'm logged in. So in part three, we're going to learn how to create a sign-in experience as well as a logout. And you're going to be able to build this layout here, the animations, the keyboard interactions, as well as connecting to Firebase. And we're going to learn how to install CocoaPods so that we can use libraries such as Firebase. And then from that user data, we're going to use environment object so that we can make it available to the entire app. And finally, to make it all persistent so that when you reload the app or you close the app and you open it again, it's going to remember the user. We're going to use user defaults. So part three has a lot of new topics. Before we start, make sure that you have downloaded the latest file so that we have the latest assets. And part of it is going to be the fingerprint icons. And this icon is taken from shape.so. You can search for fingerprint. And then we have the ability to export to PDF. Another thing I need to mention is that we have all the source files for each section of the course if you need to compare your code against mine. And also, since we're using CocoaPods, for those who are not familiar with CocoaPods, you're going to have to open the design code XC Workspace instead of Xcode Project. This step will be explained later in the course, but I just wanted to show you in case you're confused about the extra files or if you open the original file and it's not building. So this is why. But otherwise you don't have to worry about it because we're gonna start with section 40 and feel free to use my template to start learning from section 41. So this is section 41 and let's talk about new morphic design. This is a new trend and of course some people hate it, some people like it. Uh, for me, I just like to explore the techniques involved and I think it's important to learn how to create inner shadows, for example. So that's why I include it in this course. Now to understand new morphic design, you have to sort of dial back a little bit in time and uh, it started with skeuomorphic design, which is what uh, iOS started with. It's very heavy styling, a lot of shadows and lighting and textures. And in fact, before we moved to flat design, we had skeuomorphic design, which used a lot of textures such as wood, metal, paper, glass to replicate real life objects. And the reason why we did that was to make technology more familiar to a whole wave of new users who are not familiar with technology. But nowadays, fast forward 10 years from the time that iPhone 
came along, most of us are very familiar with technology, so we don't need all of these visual cues to explain what a calendar should look like or what a button should look like. Instead, we're just flattening everything. We're just using a single color with a little bit of shadow and a little bit of gradient to express the depth. And that also explains why we're using a lot more animations nowadays to compensate and create transitional interfaces. So if you take a look at iOS 13, you can see that there are a lot of transitions and it's very smooth. You can even use gestures to switch between the different apps and it's very responsive. And nowadays we have to design for a lot of screens, a lot of resolutions. And so our focus has shifted to animations, interactions and transitions. But that's not to say that we completely abandon any visual cues in the past. Drop shadows are still very much used and in iOS we use a lot of gradients, we also use background blur. And with new morphic design is just to say, well, what if you use a little bit more of that? So for example, now we can use inner shadows, drop shadow, we can set the angle of the drop shadow to be at 45 degrees angle. And we do that to make it appear more tactile because with flat design, we also lose a little bit of that feeling. And so when you look at the design like this, you can see that the drop shadow is at a 45 degree angle. We also have inner shadows, we have gradients. It's a lot simpler than 10 years ago, but it's still a little bit more complex than what we're used to nowadays. But I think with any design, with any tool, it's how you use it and where you use it more than should you use it or not, because I think it's fun to experiment with it and to learn the techniques involved so that you can decide for yourself if it makes sense for your app or not. All right, so let's get started. We're gonna learn how to create these buttons, the effects, the animations, the haptic feedback. I think it's going to be a lot of fun. Let's go to Xcode. So the first thing we're gonna do is to create a new file right after blur view. So right click here, new file. We're gonna call it buttons. Let me resume the preview and then put the text, set it to button. Then we're gonna set the font. The font is going to be dot system and we're gonna use a size weight. The size is going to be 20, the weight semi bold. Then we're gonna set the design to rounded. Now let's set the frame of our button. So the width is going to be 200. The height is going to be 60. So now we need two drop shadows. One is the bottom right and another one that is a white drop shadow from the top left. Let's start with the bottom right. So dot shadow, I'm going to use the more options. For the color, I'm going to set color parentheses, color literal. Now feel free to use black with opacity or Sometimes you can even use a light blue, for example, like this one. But since I have my own drop shadow color, I'm going to copy and paste this one. And you can find that in the text content of the course. Feel free to use mine instead. The color literal code you're going to find in the text content is going to look similar to this. But first, I'm going to have to comment. And you're going to find that it starts with the hashtag and then a bunch of values like this. So when you paste that code, it's gonna turn into a color box. For the radius, I'm gonna set it to 20, x20, 20, y20. 20. Now I just need to make sure that I have a background. So I'm gonna set a background color dot white for now. So now I have my drop shadow. I just need to add another one. Let me copy and paste the same drop shadow modifier. And for the second one, I'm going to set it to white. And instead of using x20, I'm going to set it to minus 20 and y minus 20. But the problem is when you have a white drop shadow, it's not going to show on a white background. So we're going to have to set the entire background as off white. First of all, I'm going to command click on the text, embed in VStack, and then I'm going to set the frame, so dot frame, to max width to dot infinity, max height to dot infinity as well. 
then I'm gonna set the background color and it's going to use a color literal, so color parentheses, and then I'm going to paste a lighter color versus the drop shadow. This background is going to ignore the save area, so we're gonna add a new modifier, ignore save area dot all. Okay, so already you can see the white drop shadow from the top left and the slightly darker blue drop shadow from the bottom right. Now I'm gonna set the rounded corners for the button. I'm gonna go right after the background color dot white. I'm gonna set it to clip shape, rounded rectangle, parentheses, corner radius, which is set to 16 and the style dot continuous. This is going to give us the smooth corners in iOS. Next, we're going to deal with inner shadows. As it is, we cannot create inner shadows using the shadow modifier. But what we can do is create a background modifier and put a blur layer to create that inner shadow. First of all, let me color that background. Right now it's white and I'm going to set it to a light blue. So I'm going to use the same light blue as this one. So copy and put that inside parentheses after color and then paste. Now this is the color of my button and at the same time when I'm going to add a blurred white layer on top of it, it's going to be the color of my inner shadow. But first of all, I'm going to need to set this inside a Z stack. So command click on the color embed in VStack and change from VStack to ZStack. So now I can add more color layers. Then for the second color layer, I'm going to create exactly the same shape as my current button here. In fact, I can just copy and paste the rounded rectangle code, which I'm gonna put right here. This is a simple rounded rectangle with corner radius 16 and style continuous. Then I'm gonna set it to a foreground color to dot white. Then I'm gonna add a new modifier called dot blur and I'm gonna set the blur to four. As you can see, we have some inner shadows in our button. So what's left to do is just to move that white layer. So you can move it to the bottom right and you're gonna get more inner shadow from the top left and vice versa. So let's do that. Dot offset x, I'm gonna set it to minus eight, y to minus eight. Then if I wanna add another inner shadow from the top left, then I'm gonna create another rounded rectangle, the same one, so using corner radius 16 and style continuous, and set foreground color to color literal, I'm gonna use the same one as the background. So just copy and paste inside the parentheses. So for the third color layer, I'm gonna have to get a bit creative. Instead of just moving to the bottom right, which is going to hide my previous inner shadow, I'm gonna make it smaller. And one way to do that is to use padding. So I'm gonna use padding and I'm gonna set it to two. And now thanks to that, you can see that I have a slight white inner shadow while keeping the bottom right inner shadow as well. I just need to add a bit of blur. So dot blur, I'm gonna set it to two as well. Now, of course, you can play with the colors. So for example, this third color layer can be slightly lighter. So I can just go to the color wheel and make it a little bit lighter, for example. And now it's gonna be more apparent. So we have the color of the actual button, we have the white inner shadow and a slightly darker inner shadow. But there's another thing you can do, which is to create a gradient instead of a flat color. So instead of using a foreground color modifier, I'm going to replace that with fill instead. And fill is going to allow me to have a gradient. So inside the parentheses for the fill, I'm going to be able to command shift L and then insert a linear gradient. And for this gradient, I'm gonna set it starting point from top leading 
to bottom trailing. As for the colors, I'm gonna set from light blue from the top left and at the bottom right is going to be white. Let's set white first for the bottom right. And for the first one, instead of red, we're gonna set parentheses and I'm gonna use my own light blue color. And boom, now you have your new morphic button. As you can see, regardless if you hate new morphic buttons or not, you have to admit that there are so many options in SwiftUI that allows you to create very creative UIs such as this button right here by using a combination of techniques such as background, shadows, clip shape, and of course a Z stack with three layers of colors to create this very complex styling. And the best part is everything is done in code, therefore we're gonna be able to animate it, make it interactive, and in terms of the visual, you can make it more contrasting or have different drop shadows or inner shadows. It's entirely up to you. I'm just gonna set the indentation by using Control I. So in the next session, we're going to learn how to animate this button to create a press state. And we'll also learn how to use the long press gesture. So I'll see you in the next session.